All right, hello everybody. Welcome to part two of my uh, presentation about ancient Rome. Let's check it out. So the Punic Wars were these three wars fought between Rome and Carthage way back in the day. And uh, the Carthaginians were this growing power in the ancient world. Rome was this growing power. Naturally, they're gonna have conflict. And these three Punic Wars, Carthage was defeated every single time. And the second Punic War uh, involved this Carthaginian general named Hannibal Baca. And Hannibal, by all accounts, is one of the best generals in world history. And Hannibal led an army of Carthaginians through North Africa, through Spain, through France, over the Alps Mountains into uh, Italy and just wrecked havoc. And his army had a whole contingent of armored war elephants in it. And these elephants just laid waste to Rome and really put a big fear in the Roman people. They're like, man, we can never let this happen again. So thankfully, they eventually put down Hannibal's uh, army. And in the Third Punic War, this Roman guy named Scipio Africanus, I mean, the continent of Africa gets named after him, he eventually does defeat Hannibal and afterwards the carthaginians are going to have a really bad time so okay let's check it out here's hannibal riding one of his elephants here are the elephants crossing a river and then yeah i mean imagine you're an ancient roman soldier and you see an elephant for the first time and it's an armored war elephant like this like you're gonna be scared to death it's a it's a giant scary animal with huge sharp tusks at the end of it um okay so now, uh, eventually, when this, this war concludes and the Carthaginians surrender, uh, the Roman people have this dispute, like, okay, what should we do with Carthage? Well, a lot of people in Rome um, obviously were, uh, it, it, they were affected by especially Hannibal's raid with his elephant army all around Rome. Uh, this one Roman senator named Cato the Elder, I think two of his sons were killed by Hannibal. He was really angry with the Carthaginians. So, uh, famously, Cato the Elder, every single time he had a conversation in public or he had something to say on the Roman Senate floor, he would always end his sentences with Cartago Delenda Est, which means, and Carthage must be destroyed. And, and that attitude, Carthage must be destroyed, eventually got so pervasive through Roman society, that's sort of what they did. But uh, I'll just bring this up because I just think it's funny. So supposedly Cato the Elder, you know, people would be having a conversation about, like, building a new bathroom. And he'd be like, yeah, we should build that new bathroom and Carthage must be destroyed. And, like, people would come over for dinner. They'd be like, hey, could you pass me the water and Carthage must be destroyed. You know, throwing Carthago de Lenda Est all the dang time. And uh, eventually, that's what Rome did. Rome killed all the men in Carthage, they enslaved all the women and children, they took apart the main city brick by brick, they poured salt all over the farm fields near the city of Carthage so nothing would ever grow there again for the rest of human history, and all those fancy elephants that the Carthaginians uh, had in their army and also they had around their city, there was this special breed of African ele elephant called the African Forest Elephant. It was a little bit smaller and supposedly a lot more easy to train uh, for human use. Well, the Romans put a bounty on those elephants, and they made those elephants go extinct. Uh, and, yeah, absolutely, when they destroyed the city of Carthage, they did their best to burn all records of the city. It's why we sort of don't know too much about that culture. Uh, we do know that their symbol kind of looked like this thing right here. But, um, yeah, the Carthage got thoroughly annihilated because Rome didn't want to have an enemy anymore. All right, let's check it out. So all those elephants go bye-bye. And then here's the Romans laying siege to the city of Carthage. Here they are pouring salt on the farmland, so it'll never be used for farming again. Uh, okay, so with Carthage out of the game, Rome was the only major superpower left in the Mediterranean world. So they really got to kind of develop their culture. They got to build it up to be this this top tier super city uh, for the next 400 years of human history. So here's, yeah, the Romans living the life. And uh, I'll tell you this, if you were a wealthy person in ancient Rome, you lived a good life. Uh, I could probably say you live an even better life than a wealthy person today. Maybe, you know, maybe that's a controversial point. I mean, Mr. Brown, hey, they didn't have Netflix or various phone apps, but 
they had they had some some fancy stuff okay every day you're eating exotic food shipped in from all over the ancient world uh you're constantly seeing entertainers come to your house and put on little shows um and yeah the city of rome i mean it was a big city for the ancient world i mean a million people like that that outnumbers all the other cities uh, maybe 10 or 100 times over so a huge huge metropolitan area uh here's fancy romans eating all kinds of stuff and this is uh what a roman villa would have looked like i mean it's got like you know 30 rooms in it they've got a hot tub an ice tub and just a regular indoor pool um all kinds of people working for you bringing in food all the time it was you know it was, it was fancy living for sure and yeah the here's what ancient rome actually looked like uh if you go to rome today i went to rome in 2009 uh yeah the ruins of the Colosseum are still there the hippodrome is still there parts of this aqueduct is still there uh but yeah look at the city planning though i mean the streets don't make any sense they definitely uh didn't have a, an advanced thought of how to organize the city that's for sure um Okay, but I, I need to make this point quite clear, okay? Those fancy, wealthy Romans, they had it really well because they had a whole bunch of slave labor working for them. Rome was one of the biggest slave societies in world history. Probably 40% of the people in that population were slaves. Um, but unlike slavery in the United States or in other parts of the world later in history, Roman slavery had no relationship to ethnic groups. And these slaves came from all corners of the empire. Usually they were uh, people who were conquered by Rome's armies, got taken back to Rome, and got forced into doing various labor or various duties around a Roman household. Um, but I will say that if you were a slave in ancient Rome, for the most part you did have some rights. Uh, you could earn your freedom. Sometimes slavery was only for a certain amount of years. Um, and uh you could own property you could sort of make a deal with your master and be like look i'll do this really really hard job for a year and afterwards you sent me free and masters had to had to you know do those things there were sort of laws to protect slaves weirdly enough um so yeah let's check some of the stuff out here's a bunch of slaves working in a mine and uh, i do want to mention this this is a uh, special form of punishment that the romans came up with reserved only for slaves and it's called crucifixion and by all accounts it was a terrible way to die uh what the romans would do is they would nail your hands into a board hoist you up so that your body's hanging down below your your uh your shoulders and they just leave you up there like this and a lot of people think that eventually you'll die from dehydration or starvation but that's not the case uh, typically, if you're on a crucifix, you will die from suffocation. You will eventually not be able to breathe, and you can try it yourself where you're like, if your 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 shoulders are up and your body's down, you pretend you're hanging, uh, your lungs will never fill up all the way. Uh, it's impossible to sleep. Uh, you'll eventually struggle to breathe, and you'll run out of oxygen. So you're usually up there for days, and it's a, a painful, terrible, terrible way to die. So... Um, what the heck, Rome? Why you gotta do that? Uh, all right. And then every Roman's favorite sport is something called gladiator combat. It's, uh, you know, the, of course, the big Colosseum in Rome was the, 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 the largest place to check this stuff out. But there were gladiator arenas all over the Roman Empire. And, I mean, everybody came to watch this stuff. You'd have, like, little kids in the audience just cheering as... Uh, men would just, you know, battle it out down there in the arena floor. Um, and in, in my experience of uh, watching media and sort of seeing what, I don't know, modern society knows and remembers about gladiators, I think modern society got a lot wrong. For the most part, gladiator matches were men versus beasts, okay? Like, you know, guys would get a sword and they'd fight a lion or they'd fight a bull, they'd fight a tiger. And people really love to watch that kind of stuff because like, oh, I've never seen that animal before. Let's watch someone kill it. Uh, so yeah, the, uh, the organization PETA would not be fun fond of this. Um, and every once in a while, there were, of course, gladiator matches between people. Usually they were between slaves. Um, and even more rare was when there would be a fight to the death. Uh, I know also famously in the movie Gladiator, if the, the crowd could sort of determine if a gladiator were to kill another by putting a thumbs down, be like, kill the guy, thumbs up, let him live. 
But uh, history actually got that backwards because if you put, according to Roman tradition, a thumbs down means put your sword down and let him live, and a thumbs up is pick up your sword and slice his throat open. So I was like, whoa. Um, uh, another point I just want to briefly mention is there was a slave rebellion in ancient Rome led by a gladiator slave named Spartacus. He broke out of his ludus, his sort of uh, barracks for gladiator slaves. He went around all over Rome, freed a bunch of slaves, and he ultimately tried to escape Rome with this huge freed slave group. They encountered the Roman military on their way out, and the Roman military crushed them. And uh, all the, the guys that didn't die in that battle, they were all crucified and put up and down the main highway in Rome. And yeah, those crucified slaves, they were, they, I think the, the story was there was about one crucified slave every hundred yards for some like 50 miles. So it was uh, pretty, pretty hardcore stuff. All right. So yeah, let's check it out. Here's a bunch of gladiators fighting animals. That was the typical thing. Every once in a while, gladiators fought each other as well. And yep, gladiator looking at the audience for permission to kill the guy or to let him live. And this was the major sport in, you know, in the Roman era for 400, 500 years. So this is a, a big part of the human experience, believe it or not. And here's a guy stabbing a lion. Oh, man. Uh, all right, let's talk about fashion in the ancient Roman world. So men wore togas, which are these big old sheets they kind of put around themselves. Uh, women had all kinds of fashion choices. You know, they're showing off a lot of skin right here. Uh, dyeing their hair in different colors, wearing all kinds of different fancy clothes. Um, I would also, I would honestly say that I think fashion in ancient Rome was better than fashion of all like the Middle Age period until like the year 1800. So there was there was a lot of unique stuff there. Uh, I also want to mention that I read Julius Caesar's diary, and he was really disturbed when he was exploring the world, and he found people who wore pants or wore shorts. He, he wrote in his diary something like, real men wear skirts. I'm like, wow, that's, that's funny, because we don't, we don't really do that in the modern world today. Um, okay, but now let's get into the main topic today, the Roman military. Why did Rome beat Carthage three times in a row? Why did Rome put down that Spartacus rebellion? Well, it's because their military was just so awesome. They took all the best ideas from the Spartans. They took all the best ideas from Alexander the Great. And they, their armies were so large uh, it compared to the ancient world standards. Like, they could field armies of 50,000 men, which was, like, unheard of at that time. And uh, the organization of the Roman military is the most impressive thing. Because for most of human history... Battles were just mobs of guys with swords and axes and versus another mob of guys with swords and axes and they just kind of run each other and it would be this tangled mess. And even if you were in charge of an army, you couldn't really easily give orders or maneuver your soldiers around. But the Romans trained their soldiers really well. They fought in these organized formations you see here. And like this right here, this is a, a field of a, a barbarian mob. And then here's a bunch of these Roman military soldier blocks and these perfect organized squares. And when they're in these squares like this, a general could very easily say like, hey, square three, maneuver, you know, 300 yards to the left flank. And he could move these guys around in a very organized, coordinated way. And if you can maneuver your, your blocks of soldiers and surround the enemy mob, uh, you can fight them on all sides and they're more likely to, to lose the battle and surrender. So military organization is huge, and nobody else had it like the Romans. Um, and the Roman military structure, you know, like they had sort of like platoons and um, well, what, what else are they call brigades and stuff like that. You know, that's what the United States military calls them. But back in ancient Rome, they had like cohorts and legions, and the United States military copied a lot of the concepts from ancient Rome because we read about them like they actually organized it pretty well um, and why did the Roman soldiers fight so well and why were they in this strict organizational pattern it's because the Roman government gave this deal saying hey if you sign up and join the military for 20 years after you serve you'll be given land citizenship and a retirement money pension uh, no other military in the world had anything like this and those soldiers were really loyal they fought well and they made Rome the most powerful country in the ancient world because of it. 
All right, let's check it out. So here's some Roman soldiers fighting it out. And uh, all right, here's uh, some other things you should know about the Roman military. They came up with some new military tactics that also added to their superiority. Uh, the first one is they were the first military in the world to train and use war dogs. Uh, every Roman legion had like a hundred or more trained attack dogs with them. And they would utilize the dogs in a situation where if some enemy mob ran at the Roman legion, they're fighting the legion, they can't win. As soon as the enemy mob starts to run away, that's when they unleash the dogs of war on these guys. And these war dogs are trained to, you know, sniff out people. They always run faster than humans and they'll bite at them and they'll take these guys out. So it was always a, a super scary situation when you realize you lost the battle, you're trying to run away. And then this herd of dogs is chasing you down. Um, another thing the Roman uh, legionaries used quite a bit were javelins. And usually you don't really think about javelins in warfare, but they're these long throwing spears. And what the Romans would do is they would wait right until an enemy mob is running at them. And usually you've got kind of like your strongest, most hardcore guys in the front of that charge. Well, the Roman legionnaires would throw these spears and they would usually kill all the enemy guys in that front rank. And, you know, if you're behind someone who just, you're, you're behind a guy who just gets hit with a spear, you're going to be like, whoa, and you're going to be a little less inclined to fight. Um... Uh, Romans also invented the first kind of siege equipment. This is called a scorpion, but it was this giant crossbow machine that could launch javelins or big old arrows for hundreds of yards. So pretty impressive stuff. All right, here's the attack dog formation. They are throwing javelins. And uh, okay, here's my last story today. So uh, this Roman general named Julius Caesar, he used all the tactics I mentioned to really good use. And for something like 10 years, he was chasing around the uh, king of the Gaul people. Gaul is in modern day France. And uh, Julius Caesar was chasing around the king of the Gauls, Vicingetorix. And eventually Vicingetorix decided to put up a defensive formation on top of this hill. Uh, so Julius Caesar sort of analyzed the situation. He's like, well, if I attack Vicingetorix on top of that hill, he's going to beat me. So Julius Caesar decided to build a giant wall around that hill, and he said, I'm just going to starve Vicingetorix out. So Vicingetorix saw Julius Caesar building this wall. He ordered his men to attack. The attack was kind of a stalemate. So Vicingetorix was like, okay, I'm going to call my cousin. He's going to send in another army to help us out. So we'll just, you know, hold out until my cousin shows up. Well, so, you know, there's Julius Caesar. He has his men in this wall formation surrounding Vicingetorix. And then Julius Caesar hears a message that another army of Gaul people are coming to attack him. So Julius Caesar does a pretty ingenious move where he keeps his wall to trap Vicingetorix. And then he builds another wall around his own men to defend him from Vicingetorix's reinforcements. So it's sort of like... Vicingetorix is in the middle, there's a wall, there's the Romans, there's another wall, and then there's the, the Gaul reinforcements. So Julius Caesar now kind of trapped himself in the middle of this, this ring. Um, but Julius Caesar had tons of supplies. He knew he could outlast the Gauls. Vicingetorix was starting to starve to death. His men were eating horses and stuff. Um, and the Gauls tried to attack the Romans and they failed. And eventually Vicingetorix surrendered and as soon as he gave up, all of the Gaul lands joined the Roman Empire. So, pretty smart tactical choice there, Julius. We'll learn a lot more about Julius Caesar in my next video as well. All right, so here's Vicingetorix surrendering to uh, the Caesar man. And we'll learn more about him next time. All right, peace out.